Okay. Welcome. Welcome to another installment of Conversations with Willie about permaculture and transitions and uh, other things, perhaps uh, French wine or global politics. Who knows what we'll find here. My guest today is uh, Matthew Dom from Paris. Matthew, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you're working on. Hi, Willie. Um, so my name is Mathieu Dorm. Um, I'm based in Paris. Um, I'm 40 years old. I'm French, but I spent quite a bit of time uh, in England. And in fact, that's where I discovered permaculture. Um, my current work, and it's been like that for the last 10 years, um, has been in organizational consultancy. So basically, I work with um, individuals with teams, and I help them work better together. And that can be um, in the way they've been functioning over the last years. They just want to um, to look at their own dynamics and see you know, how they might um, evolve a bit. Or it may be in situations where the the key focus is to bring in innovation, um, and I help them think about things differently. Think about their work, think about themselves, and from that, I help them um, work differently. That's the whole idea. So, moving from thinking to acting, um, from intention to realizing, basically. Excellent. Um, Matthew, why, uh, why are you in LinkedIn? What does LinkedIn do for you? Well, LinkedIn is, uh, is a network, so it's, uh, it helps me connect to a uh, a wide range of people, um, some of them very different from one another, but um, it's actually different connections and different center of interest that I've got, uh, and people have met you know, through the years, and I've recently joined a few groups, in fact, and I think that's how we met, um, through one of the permaculture groups, and I think it's, I mean, it's a kind of endless, kind of bottomless a uh, place to find information, ideas, people having conversations. And I think for me, that's part of you know, my core business, is to, uh, to hold and sustain interesting conversations. Excellent. Hmm. A lot of people are um, quite adamant or resistant to taking permaculture into any other arena or conversation. Mm -hmm. They want to hold it to its strict values and its uh, Mollison, Holmgren, uh, you know, vision. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what, what resistance have you gotten as you've taken this uh, metaphorical journey and applied permaculture to uh, human systems? as you've done for us in LinkedIn? Well, so far, um, I haven't met many resistances uh, around me, and I don't think I had many in me. I mean, I've been thinking about this for quite a while, because permaculture and gardening and um, working and being in nature, that's been part of my life for many, many years, I mean, 30 years. Um, and the work I'm doing, th these are two strands that I wanted to connect. I've been wanting to connect them for a while, so um, I started doing that earlier this year. And for me, I mean, I, uh, there's no kind of um, impermeable boundaries, you know, that can't be crossed. For me, I, I work very much with metaphors, and in some ways I'm using permaculture thinking metaphorically in thinking about organizations, and that enables me to make links. Now, I haven't met many resistances around me in doing that. Um, the, only, the only ones maybe that I've found were around people's reluctance to engage with um, organizations, and in particular with private organizations, as if that was a, a territory that wasn't uh, holy enough for permaculture. <laughs> I see. You know, but I think, you know, I think um, 
Permaculture is very useful to uh, reclaim wasteland and um, to re regenerate um, toxic lands. So why not apply it to um, uh, organizational lives, especially you know in this 21st century, many organizations have gone uh, a bit over the top and sometimes are toxic, whether to their people or to the, the economic system. It seems to me even more a reason a reason to um, to think this through using permaculture. Hmm. Okay. Well, one of my um, interests, uh, one of the classes I teach is in the sacred quality or nature of permaculture. Uh, you direct some of us to uh, Holmgren's 12 principles. Holmgren doesn't speak to the sacred. Uh, Mullison also shies away from such topics. What I want to talk to you about is uh, what's sacred to you and what's sacred to you about permaculture? Well, um, first of all, I'd like to say that I found it very interesting. Um, you're focusing and you're bringing all thinking to that realm because it's... Um, in many ways, quite daunting. It's quite powerful, and um, and the the healings I've made reading some of the work that uh, I read of yours is um, that in many ways, you know, in organizational life, there's a loss of meaning, a loss of uh, common purpose, a loss of spirituality in the workplace, and I think these these all connect to. Um, to, uh, the sacredness of uh, of all being humans, which which I think is maybe getting lost. Although part of my work recently has been working with religious orders, so in many ways I'm uh, reconnecting to the sacred in that way. Um, what's sacred to me? Ultimately, I think it's um, human connections. Uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, is how we humans connect to the broader realm of nature. And uh, so hum sacred human connections for me means that uh, in engaging in relationships in the workplace, it's about respecting others as um, full human beings. So it's a subject-to-subject -subject relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, the many, there are many implications there. One of them is about um, working with respect and suspension of judgment um, and accepting the other fully, even though you know, at times, and you know, sometimes it's many times, they challenge us and they, you know, they irritate us or whatever. So how do we move beyond wanting to act out on that in a fragmenting way um, so that we can respect um, the, uh, the human bonds that exist between us beyond anything we can imagine. Mm. That's one, one key strand. The other is that we are, um, I believe we are fully, uh, fully part of nature. I mean, even saying that, it, brings in some kind of fragmented thinking. In, in some ways, we are nature. And if we are nature, then there is something sacred about the way we relate to it. Um, which means that in many ways, here too, there ought to be a subject-to-subject -subject relationship. Hmm. I think we've been um, losing sight of that over the last century. And it, maybe recovering it a bit coming into this century, um, you know, in particular with the um, ideas of all footsteps and um, green building, green design, eco-concepts, you know, eco-designing, all these things. So maybe we're recovering that. I hope we are. <laughs> so what's the difference between sustainability and permaculture? That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> Good luck. I, I don't think they operate or even start from the same point. Uh, in, in many ways, sustainability 
um, is a, you know could be about um, keeping the same model, but um, making changes, overhauling it so that it, the model is sustainable. And um, in order for the model to be sustainable, it has to be more respectful of nature. And I think permaculture starts from a very different point. Um, the point it starts from is nature. Um, nature knows how to operate. It learns that empirically over the last, I don't know, three billion years. And so it has design principles and ways of um, connecting all the different parts uh, in a way that is uh, self self sustainable, that is high yielding, and that doesn't need any input. I mean, the, the trouble about our current model is that we input a lot of energy uh, very inefficiently. Mm. Nature doesn't. Mm. Nature very good. Flows. Yes, I understand. Good. Um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the model I sent you in the email today. Do you have that in front of you somewhere? Yeah, I'll just put it up on my screen. Yeah. So. <clears throat> is it controversial to place permaculture in the center of our social movement, in our social lives? Have you seen it as such? Well, I think for me that the, the, the key novelty there is, um, is the yellow circle, the sacred. Um, so that in many ways, I've seen permaculture values and principle as a um, as a bridge between community building and, and designing with nature. But reconnecting us to a third point, which is about um, uh, meaning, purpose, uh, and the sacred, as you call it. I mean, for me, that's new. Mm. Um, in many ways, it's replacing um, a human being um, much more at what its place should be in many ways, which is, uh, you know, we are smaller than this bigger hole that we're a part of. And right. In some way, I see that in your model. Oh, huh, interesting. Okay. Tell, <clears throat> tell me about what's happening with localization efforts in uh, Paris. Localization? Uh-huh. Well, in Paris, um, is a big, is a big city. Um, but it, yeah. there's a new, there's a new movement. You know the transition towns movement, which started off in um, in the UK. Yes. Uh -huh. That's kind of uh, reached Paris and uh, and the, the suburbs and also other parts of France. In fact, I live in the suburbs um, south of Paris, and we've uh, been looking at developing what we call here a, a post-carbon um, town. So there are efforts to um, to bring about new models, you know, on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a cultural difference. I mean, it's interesting, as I mentioned earlier on, I've, I've lived in the UK for 12 years. Um, and in fact, um, the, the chap who started the Transition Town movement is a close friend of mine. And I noticed in the UK a much more kind of um, on the ground energy. You know, let's start do things ourselves. Here in France, there is um, an old culture of um, waiting for the government to bring about the resources for us to do things. Um, so it, it feels more difficult to shift. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's, there's plenty of energy and new ideas and people who are looking for alternatives. A lot of um, what we call here um, and, uh, social economy. Oh, okay. Interesting. So lots of activities and people trying to make links between you know, what we call social economy and more mainstream economy. Um, and even trying to redefine new realms of, of economy so that we don't get um, trapped in old thinking. You know, so, let's say, and yeah. those 
on the one hand and big corporates on the other. You know, how can we um, create hybrid systems, hi hybrid fields as well in which to operate? Mm -hmm. That's very exciting. So how do you how do you reconcile permaculture with uh, the capitalist uh, the capitalist way of life? What has to change? Hey, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of seconds. Go ahead. Give me an overview. I think, um, you know, g give it a couple of minutes. Yeah, right. I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm not a great economist anyway, but it seems to me that the system we're in now is even beyond capitalism. Um, it, it's a model in which um, it's kind of gone one, one level further up and, it, and many things are being um, dictated by finances and, and flow of money is across the globe. Um, so I, I can't see how this um, will help, you know, how this can provide the conditions for even a sustainable um, economy, let alone a, a more permaculture-based economy. But I think the, the old ideas uh, behind capitalism, which is that you invest you know, at the beginning, um, and through your investment, you, you create further value. I mean, that, that as a principle, you know, why not? You, you could think you've got a piece of land, you've got some seeds, you've got, you get hold of some manure, and then you start trying to rearrange your land so that it produces. I think with permaculture um, thinking in terms of economy, um, we could start looking at much more capital investment at the beginning so that we create self-sustaining um, systems. And so, right. so capital receives and it's important. It just, it, it's a kind of trigger, uh, a kind of catalyst at the beginning so that we, we create wealth through our activities for exchanges. It's not money that creates uh, more money, it's activity skills, it's uh, relationships, it's innovation, um, and I think that's possible, but we need to shift the way we think and, and the way we work, the way we are. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, interested to talk to you about how permaculture can be deployed after disasters and after wars. Have you thought about that specific application or, or, or challenge? I haven't. I haven't really. But um, I'm thinking, you know, when I hear you say that, it makes me think about how can we deploy permaculture um, to recover toxic lands or wastelands. Or, um, and I think um, there is something about um, going back and uh, diving into the system, working from where the system is at, and something about um, re reigniting some key living principles, principles that will enable you know the flow of um, energy to start again in, the, mm -hmm. in, in virtuous cycles, and I think it's. Uh, I think what permaculture will teach us there is that it's not about, you know, having um, big plans and uh, big action plans and big reporting mechanisms. It's much more about working um, you know, on the ground with the reality there and picking up where, where there is still energy waiting to be um, released for creation, for uh, development. Mm -hmm. And at the same mm -hmm. time, I think um, we, we would also need to pay great attention to the toxicity that a disaster or a war will have generated. Uh, and when I mean toxicity, 
I mean, not only the um, physical toxicity on the land and in the water, but toxicity in in the human field. You know, so the, the way it's impacted or even destroyed uh, key relationships, the way it's maybe fragmented communities and polarized them, um, the way it's destroyed hope, you know, this kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. So what about the opposite opposite direction? Well, how would you look at the uh, permaculture values and principles in the, the wine country in France, uh, a well-established uh, ecosystem and business? How would you how would you slip in permaculture in such a place like that? Now this is an interesting question for a wine lover like me. Um, <laughs> well. There is, um, over the last, the nine, 15, 20 years, there's, there's been a new generation of um, winemakers who are also wine growers, so they're, they're, they're there right the way along the cycle. Um, and they are trying to, um, to uh, insert their practice much more in harmony with nature. So there's a lot more... Um, organic wine, for example, even biodynamic wine, and uh, also much more about um, connecting the vineyards with its surrounding, bringing in flowers, um, you know, bringing in the wildlife, um, at least around the vineyards, maybe, uh, maybe in the vineyards. Um, I'm not sure you'll, you know, you'll ever move away from the rows of... Um, you know, in the vineyard. Uh, also, they, they're very beautiful, if you like wine. Um, but I think it's maybe much more, uh, it may be something about connecting that system, that wine growing system, um, to its surrounding in a permaculture way. So it also involves the way the wine will be, um, I mean, the grapes will be harvested, the way the wine will be made, uh, without expanding energy to make the wine locally, um, the way the bottles will be reused, uh, and also the way it will be marketed and sold. And in fact, in France, France remains a country where uh, a lot of the wine, you know, is sold within only 10 or 15 miles of where it's produced. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's very sustainable. It is. And, uh, uh, and I mean, the... Um, what you find in, in uh, wine shops or supermarkets in France, or in Paris, for example, is a very, very limited um, range of what you can get if you go locally. And when you go locally and you go on a, let's say, a week holiday touring the Bordeaux region or, or the Provence region, you will discover very nice wines that you'll never find anywhere else but there. Ah, interesting. They don't need to go anywhere else. They're doing fine just like it is. That's right. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, okay. Well, one of the other things I like to talk about, write about, is uh, mythology yeah. and, and story mm -hmm. and archetype and all these good things. Um, you've probably seen a couple of those uh, ideas. Tell me how permaculture as a movement, as a young movement, is reflected in its metaphors and symbols and songs. What can you tell me about the mythology of permaculture? Well, the one thing that comes to mind to me is, um, is the, the drawing on Bill Mollison's uh, book um, with um, its name. Um, I think biting its um, its tail um, in the rainbow uh, rainbow color. Yeah. And the um, you know the image of uh, of cycles that you know, that's generated through the drawing. Um, beyond that, I have to say really that um, I don't know much you know much about the um, symbolisms. And the, um, I mean, another one that comes to mind is you know, how you move from a walnut to a tree and what the walnut 
symbolizes as um, something that holds within it the tree that will grow. That's, that's very limited, and, um, and I think there is uh, plenty of scope to bring more there, or well, at least plenty of scope for me to discover what's maybe already, um, already out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, I, see, I see a real uh, void and a real opportunity to help uh, help explain and promote perm- uh, permaculture through new story and in song, etc. Mm. Um, so that's one of my charges. Right. Um, what uh, What is a tribe to you? What is it? What, when I say tribe, what does it mean to you? A tribe is. It's a group of people bound by um, something very strong. Um, that's to do with, with uh, passion, and uh, maybe even more um, primitive. Something uh, that connects them, I guess, to the earth in many ways. And even when you say tribe, it's, um, it's a group of people on a piece of land. Um, or connected to that piece of land. So, in the in the jargon of the day, uh, is uh, a tribe a s- intentional community? Is that an analogy? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a tribe a tribe is an intention an intentional community and a bit more. And that bit hmm. more, I think, it has to do with the uh, the more kind of um, spiritually rooted dimension of the tribe, or even earthly rooted dimension of the tribe. Inten- intentional communities, for me, they can be um, much more kind of um, uh, at a much more intellectual level. But they, they don't necessarily involve something that. Um, yeah, more, more primitive, not not in a negative sense, but in a primitively connecting us to um, being part of a, of a bigger whole. Yeah. yeah, it sounds it sounds like uh, we agree that permaculture is taking us back and forward at the same time in the same moment. That's a very difficult thing to sell to the middle class, yeah. isn't it? Yes, although what I personally find attractive about permaculture is that um, you don't have to take the whole thing um, or nothing at all. You can you can pick and choose aspects of it mm-hmm. without, I think, um, doing it any injustice. So you can go for the more kind of um, solution-focused um, tips or tools or uh, ideas and you can use it as um, uh, you know as a thread that will connect different parts of uh, what you're trying to do in your garden in your local community or you can move it um, you know even beyond that as a kind of social or political transformation tool mm-hmm. but uh, I I feel that you can easily choose without um, being disloyal to any of them. Well, I guess uh, we could argue that Mollison would disagree. He would say it's probably a, a systems approach. You can't pick and choose like going to the supermarket. You can't have one part of it without the other. But that's another discussion. Mm. What I wanted to what I wanted to end with was. Lots of people uh, have a as a, have a, a similar criticism of the transition towns movement, mm-hmm. and uh, what I've been hearing in the last uh, year and a half is that it's a it's a movement based in part on fear, fear of the future, fear of the unknown, fear of shortage, mm-hmm. fear of fighting, fear of whatever. What what is your take on the fear aspect of not only the transition town movement, but just the crash that's coming. Well, I, I would disagree with, um, with those who um, view the transition movement or even permaculture as a, a response to fear. I think it's uh, an alternative to fear. 
my, my felt experience of um, the transition movement is, is that it's based on um, trying to recover um, a, a type of abundance uh, within a realistic framework and also about uh, being um, much more the actors of uh, what will come, the creators, you know, the initiators of our future, rather than um, you know turning our back and hoping it doesn't hit us. So um, no, I mean that part of what really inspired me in permaculture and transition movement is the kind of optimism and the sense of innovation, the sense of um, um, when we connect. Uh, and form um, you know, the group, we're stronger than, uh, than if we're trying things on our own. So all that, all that I think is much more about being generative and being fearful. Now the crash that's coming, I mean, it, it, is, um, it is worrying, and uh, you know, I'm speaking from Paris, so the heart of Europe, and you know, it's not, uh, probably every day at the moment we're hearing on the news about the Eurozone, and will it crash, will it not crash? Uh, yeah. Greece. Yeah, with Greece, and uh, you know, who's next after Greece, Ireland, Spain, and will Germany agree with France? And, and it seems that, um, you know, if the Eurozone crashes, it will cost everyone a lot of money, and if it doesn't crash, then it will cost everyone a lot of money to save it. Um, so that's, that is worrying, and, and I think for me at the heart of what's worrying is that um, I have a sense that we've, um, we've given birth to um, a system that's kind of um, done frenzy, and um, you know, of course we can't control it, but I think we're, um, we haven't quite given up the, um, uh. the illusion that we can control it. The thing is, we can't. So how do we work with it to steer it somewhere that's less risky? Is it possible? I don't know. Yeah. So, are you somebody who would uh, run for politics? Would you run for mayor of Paris to infuse permaculture in the mainstream? That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm um, funny enough. I I am. Um, I am venturing into politics, but in a very different way, um, because what what I have noticed, and in, in some ways that's very inspired by the my thinking about permaculture, is that what's um, really disappointing me, or even frustrating me, enraging me these days, is not so much you know what I am hearing. Uh, it's not so much the ideas or or the lack of ideas. It's the way people are interacting on the political field. It's the actual political field itself that, yeah. um, that I feel has become um, really sterile, fragmented, polarized, and so can only generate um, unhelpful ideas. So my venture into politics is uh, I'm, I'm launching an initiative which um, I think I've called something like political dialogues. And uh, it's about reintroducing um, the art of dialoguing into the realm of politics so that we can, like you and I have been doing, you know, speak to each other, actually hear what the other is saying, uh, work with it, even though we may not be fully in agreement. It's something about recovering our capacity to uh, think together because I think we've got massive challenges in front of us and unless we recover the ability to work together at solving them then you know, that, you know, then that's uh, we're in for deep trouble so yes <laughs> I'm trying to see how we can uh, maybe re-educate our political um, uh, you know, political leaders, so that the, the project will be about in, uh, involving people from political parties and teaching them a new way of relating, first of all, in among themselves, 
Because even within the same party, you know, you find a lot of, um, of splitting, fragmenting, polarizing. But if we can reintroduce in each, you know, key political party um, a different way of uh, being together and working together, conversing and thinking together, then we'll see if we can expand that to um, uh, getting people from different parties to talk to each other in a new way. Hmm. But it can, so, it can offer us, you know, true alternatives that, that are interesting, appealing, and not the same ones, you know, as ever, which is about telling us why the other one's wrong, but never really um, taking in, but also it's bringing in and, and, and need to be responded to. Uh, well, I, uh, I vote for the permaculture party. Yeah, the permaculture party. That sounds uh, paradoxical. <laughs> well, my friend, it's been great to speak to you. I will post this. And uh, again, I don't know what's wrong with my camera, but I focused on you, so I won. I won out in the end. And uh, I'll look forward to more of your work in LinkedIn and the permaculture groups. Yeah, that'd be great. I find it great, and I want to know more about your uh, your initiative as it rolls out. Uh, yeah, I'll keep you updated on that. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, Willie. That was great. And All right, hang me, in there. Send me the link so I can uh, I can see what it was. What it was like. Oh. Um, I'm going to plaster you all over Northern California and the, and the globe. Wow. Oh, yeah. No, this isn't just for you and me. This is for publication. Right. <laughs> Thanks again, my friend. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Okay. Bye.